Can you describe the first day you actually visited Pennhurst even without your camera? Yes, I was with the Junior Chamber of Commerce, Mainline Junior Chamber of Commerce, and we were going through these buildings. And what you can't show on TV is the smell. The smell was unbelievable. I mean, you had 80 people in a room, and no one's taking care of them, and the smell was just incredible. They're not bathed, they, they, their bathroom habits were non-existent. It was no one to help them out. And just to see them in that way and just watch them rock and be being ignored. And I, I have to say, it wasn't the attendance fault. You had two attendants for 80 people. I couldn't have done any better, nor anybody I know could have done any better. But this was the condition, and I was, my eyes were just wide open. I was thinking, why doesn't anybody care about this? And that's when I start talking to the attendants. I start talking to some of the administrators. And some of the administrators were elated that I was there because this is the first time they could get their word out without getting fired. So they would help me out all the time. I'd get notes, phone calls. It was great. So uh, that was my first reaction. And I, uh, this is what people don't know. My cameraman and my sound man had a very difficult time. They wanted to leave. Like, I can't stand this anymore. I have to get out of here. And I used to have to give them breaks, you know, kind of calm them down. We got to do this and t try to explain that this is really worthwhile doing, which they did. They hung in for, for uh, five days, five straight days. What, what was their reaction based on? Was it based on just the physical smell or just an emotional reaction? It was an emotional reaction. You know, we, they had the same reaction I did. How could we do this to these people? And it was we. And, you know, to see it every day. And the people there were starved for any kind of attention. And we'd walk into a ward, you know, and, and all they wanted to do was touch you. And if you hugged them, They'd go, they'd cry. It was, it was so unbelievable, and it, it got to all of us. And uh, you know, it was hard to stay there all day. Well, do you remember the first resident at Penhurst that you encountered? No, I just remember going into this giant room with people rocking, banging their heads, you know, just sitting around doing nothing. The, the, this absolute despair kind of got to me. The People, the staff at Penhurst, particularly the administrative staff, um, seemed very frank in their interviews with you. Why do you think it was that they were more guarded given the conditions at Penhurst? Oh, I think some of the reasons the people at Penhurst, the administrators, were open to me was because they wanted to confess. They worked in this atmosphere all the time and no one was listening to them. So now I was their vehicle to get the word out to their bosses. I think that had a lot to do with it. Uh, I think some people who had been there a long time became a little callous to the situation, really didn't see the forest for the trees. Uh, the attendants and some of the administrators were just ecstatic. Like, God, I've been trying to get somebody to listen to me all these years, and no one was listening. And I, you know, I gave them a vehicle so they could be heard. And they, I had to protect them because I didn't want them to get fired, but they helped me enormously. They were really great. I couldn't have done it without them. You, you've said that, I mean, I've read this, you've said it here now, that a lot of the staff were really sort of angels trying to do good against, you know, really. Incredible you know, odds. Un, un, unbeatable odds, but did you come across some of your staff, some of the Penhurst staff that you thought maybe as you said, were more callous or just were oh, sure. different to the... Yeah, I, I saw some staff members who were callous. Most of them were not. Most of them were really dedicated people making $75 a week to go in and take care of 80 people a day. That's incredible. Uh, but there's some people, there were some people there that uh, who became callous to the situation and shouldn't have been working there. Uh, but they were few and far between. Most of them were absolutely dedicated but overwhelmed. Let me give you the best example. Went into a ward, and there were 80 cribs, 80 cages, metal cribs. And some of the people in the cribs, I mean, they ranged in age from six months to five years. Their legs were this thick. That's their thigh. So I asked, how come these people are in these cages? How come they can't walk? 
And the attendant said, because they opened a the closet and they had like 80 mattresses. And they said, because we don't have enough people to put these mattresses on the floor so they can learn how to crawl, because you had to learn how to crawl before you can walk. So they stayed in a cage 24 7 for years. I, I was like, you're kidding me. No, that is the reason. We just can't. And then I thought about it. I mean, you're changing diapers, 80 people, two attendants. There's just no way. And that's the way it was. You know, you, you've described the smell of Penhurst when you first walked in and how overwhelming that was. I imagine Penhurst as being also a cacophony of sound given all of the people. Um, and yet when I look at Suffer the Little Children, there's little to no ambient sound in your, in your broadcast. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why that is well, you and, why, remember, and what you heard. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the two things that, you know, you, at Penhurst that you noticed right away was the smell and the sound. The sounds were people moaning all day long, moaning, groaning, you know, pleading for help. It was terrible. The reason we did not have a lot of natural sound, we've got to remember when we did this, 1968, it wasn't a big deal. Sound was uh, only used for interviews. You know, now everything's natural sound, you want it to be. But there was even a, an area in, in the documentary where I remember we didn't have sound, I just showed pictures, but it was silence. You know, if I had to do it now, I'd make a big deal of the sound, but so be it. You know, it's a long time ago. But that's why we did not have a lot of natural sound. We just, it just wasn't that important. You, just, you didn't think that way. And what kind of sounds did you hear when you were working through Penhurst? Well, the people, I mean, you know, like I said, the, the sounds in Penhurst were sounds of pain, uh, neglect. They, they would just moan. They would just cry. They would just be banging their heads. I mean, uh, some people did it out of frustration. You know, I, I want a feeling. So I banged my head. I had to wear helmets all day long. It, it was incredible. And what's even more incredible, when you met people who were slightly retarded or not retarded at all, it was a dumping ground for anybody. And you wondered why they were there and how they, in their own minds, like went downhill instead of uphill. It, that was horrible. That was horrible to see. What did your producers think? You, you know, your crew had such a visceral reaction to this terrible place. What did your producers, who didn't think there was a story to begin with, yeah. think when you started bringing back this very, very troubling footage? Uh, that's an interesting question because I, I, I do remember distinctly when I first came back, we worked all day and I mean, we were mentally and physically wiped out. And when I brought the, the film, it was film, you had to process it, and then you had to edit it. I called the news director down, and he watched it, and he was almost in tears. He just couldn't believe it. He said, Bill, I, I thought you were exaggerating. I said, Barry, I understand, but this is it. He said, and at the time, we ran stories, and they were a minute 45. I was getting like six and seven minutes. The last one, I think, was 23 minutes. But... The bottom line was, uh, the, the bad news was that I, it, when we put it on the air the first day, we got such an unbelievable reaction from the public, we didn't know what to do. It was like the biggest reaction we ever got for anything. So they told me, you know, you got to go back tomorrow, you got to continue this. And I had been working like 16 hours because I had to write it, I had to produce it, I had to edit it. So, you know, I'm not really getting very much sleep, like three or four hours sleep, I was sleeping in the building in the ladies room. So I had to go back the next day, and, and then the reaction game got bigger, and it was like, well, you got to do it again. And I was taking these uh, no-dose pills. I, I was, by the fifth day, I, I couldn't speak. I lost my voice because I was just so tired, and my body just gave way. So I wrote it. I wrote the last day, and I couldn't read it. So John Facenda read it. Maybe that was the best thing that ever happened, but... I just passed out. I just couldn't do it anymore. It was like 24-7 after the fourth day was done. Why, would, why was it the best thing that happened that John read? Because John was so good. John's the voice of God. You know, he's the NFL guy. He's, he's great. I, mean, I never thought about it at the time, but, you know, afterwards, I said, geez, that was really great. He, re he read that thing perfectly. Here's a guy that had been in the business for 20 years at the time, and I've been in there 20 days. There's no comparison. But... Uh, it worked out. 
you know, when you you did your report, I think, I think rightly so, you put so much of the responsibility for the conditions at Penhurst on the community mm -hmm. and the indifference of the community. And True. you've described an overwhelming response to the piece as it aired. Um, in fact, we know that from our parent advocates. They were so incredibly thrilled to see that finally conditions at Penhurst were being exposed. I can imagine there were also parents whose children were in Penhurst who were heartbroken. I wonder if you can describe a little bit about the types of comments that were coming to you with this huge overwhelming public response. All right, here's the bad news. The bad news about Penhurst is that we've ignored those people much too long, maybe 50 years at the time. Here's the good news. When people were exposed to it, as I said, we got the biggest reaction we ever got, I think, to this day. And to the public's credit, they jumped on it. They were infuriated. They were writing to their congressmen. They were writing to their state senators and representatives. And there was a demand to change things. And they did. So when people were exposed to it, they reacted in a positive fashion. And that made me feel great. Like I said, it's probably the, the greatest thing I ever did, best thing I ever did. And I was in the business for 43 years, and that was the first and probably the best. What, when you started out, what did you hope to accomplish with the piece? What did you think was possible to accomplish with the piece? Uh, I, I was naive, I have to admit. Uh, I was hoping to expose this thing to get a little reaction. Never did I dream of the reaction that I did get. But I was happy. I wanted to see things improve one way or another. And uh, because of people, because of everyday people, uh, they improved greatly. And I think it changed the entire system. Because what a lot of people don't know is after we did this, the response was so great that CBS sent it out to all the O&O stations and told them, go find a place near you and do a story on it. That's, that's how Geraldo Rivera got started. He found a place called Woodside or something up in New York. And, and WCBS did the story after we did. And they did it in every other station. They tried to find a place. Were there any questions when you were interviewing staff at Penhurst that you, you wish you had, had asked, but you <laughs> didn't or felt like you couldn't? No, I, I, I mean, I tried my best at the time. I mean, at, at times I was in shock. Uh, I would be like, like Jesse Fear was the guy that blew me away, that I would sit there and listen to this guy tell me how he tortured people. And I could not really react the way I, I wanted to really start screaming at the guy. But I, I had to remain cool and calm and just keep him talking and see how long he would go. And he just kept on going. And uh, I, I know at times some of the administrators were really embarrassed you know, because uh, they knew they were blowing it and they didn't do what they should have been doing and they didn't fight hard enough. Uh, but it was an interesting experience sitting on the other side and listening and trying to control my own emotions. And believe me, I had them. And I just couldn't just start screaming. The, the report that you did at the end, um, Channel 10 made some recommendations. I think yes. I have some of them written here. They wanted to obviously end the overcrowding, mm -hmm. add physicians, add gynecological care for women, teachers with special education experience, etc. And you've said that there were some improvements after your report. Can you tell me a little bit about what those improvements were? Or? Yeah, they, they got $16 million, which was quite good. And uh, things changed rapidly. They, they start taking people out, put them other places. The whole idea of community living, you know, had, had a little traction. Uh, they did get added staff. The women got brassiers, you know, crazy stuff like that. Uh, there, there was a noticeable change almost immediately, and then it continued, just kind of snowballed because it stayed in the news. And uh, we, we did like four follow-ups, four half-hour follow-ups, which I cannot find. They're lost in, I don't know where they are. I, I can remember, I did one, no, it was called No Less Precious, and I did another one, Lest We Forget, and there was a fourth one. But we, 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 kept, we kept at it. It wasn't one, one of these jobs where we just did the story and left. No, we went back again and again and again, and, 
And every time we did another series, there was another reaction from Harrisburg, which was positive. So that was good. Made us feel great. And we had parties up there for the people. The entire station went out. It was, it was good. We, we did kind of make a difference. At one point in the report, I think, I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing, you said that people with disabilities needed a brilliant orator to sort of trumpet their cause. They had none. Zero. Yes. The, the retarded, at the time it was called retarded, the retarded uh, had no advocates that, that made a difference. There was no one out there screaming about it, showing it. Uh, they were just lost. And it was a dumping ground. If you were in court in Philadelphia and you were a pyromaniac, and this is a real story, they didn't know what to do with you, and they sent you to Pennhurst. I, I, I met a couple of guys who were pyromaniacs, and they were up there, and t they were like wolves. You know, they went in with lambs. It was crazy. Uh, they just dumped you there because not even the judges understood it. Mental retardation and men mental illness was the same in their mind, and there's an enormous difference. Uh, if they didn't know what to do with you, send them to Pennhurst. Just get, get, out of, get out of my way. Get out of my sight, and everything will be fine. And that's, that, that was the real problem. That had to end. They were so backwards up there. I'll give you another example. It just used to kill me. I used to wonder why they segregated the males and females. Now, I'm talking about eating breakfast or lunch. And there was a minister up there named Cal Carey. And Cal and I question this. Why, why can't they eat together? Why can't they socialize? And the answer was, this is how backward they were. The answer was they thought there would be a mass orgy. There would be riots, uh, there were rapes, this would be horrible, violent. Our whole thing was, why don't you give it a try, see what happens. They gave it a try. You know what happened? They ate. They ate, they talked, and that was it. It was like, but no one would even give it a try in 50 some years. I mean, how insane is this? It was, we just used to sit there and go, I, I can't believe this is happening. And then the, what, what people also didn't know the better you were, the more normal you were, the harder you worked, the less of a chance you had of ever leaving. You know why? Because you worked for nothing. You can mow the lawn, you can do the laundry. They kept you there. So if you were there at 21 or 22 and you just need a little help, you were there for 40 years because they wouldn't let you go because you were too important to the operation. Is that sad? Is that incredible? Yeah, that's the way it was. Well, and with your talking about this, um, I'm thinking of a boy that you interviewed. I want to say his name is Johnny. Yes. Who I remember him really very well. Was just a child who perhaps needed, you know, a better <laughs> educational situation. There was nothing really going on. When, when I met Johnny in Penhurst, I immediately knew he didn't belong there. Uh, he had his problems, but they weren't. He was not mentally retarded. He should have been a place for mental illness, maybe, because his IQ was almost normal. But it decreased over time because of the environment he was in. He reacted to the environment, which is normal. And, uh, you know, he regressed all the time. And, you know, God only knows what happened to that poor guy. But if he was, if he, if he was put into a situation where he had some help, I'm, I'm sure he would have been a productive member of society. I don't know if he ever had a chance to do that. So do you think there's been someone to champion these causes or champion people like Johnny? Has there been one person that stood out in the time that you've covered the, this community? Well, there, there are a lot of people, a lot of people who, who, who do not get uh, credit. Uh, some of the people who should get credit for the, the enormous changes at Pennhurst and mental retardation are former Lieutenant Governor Ray Broderick, who was also a judge. He never really got the credit he deserved. Uh, Tom Gill, who was a lawyer, uh, he, he championed the cause for years. Uh, the nameless people in the background that helped me out, uh, they, they deserve an enormous amount of credit and we'll never get it. But without them, things would still be the same out there, I'm sure. And uh, Broderick especially, he was really instrumental in getting things changed, no doubt about it. Because when he became a judge, he got the case. Man, that was, uh, that was great. He knew exactly what was going on. So, Bill, your own work, you've worked as a broadcaster for more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. 
where does this piece for you personally fit into the body of your work, the Suffer the Little Children piece that you did on Pinterest? Here's the ironic part. It's probably, in my own mind, the best thing I ever did, uh, most effective thing I, I've ever done, and uh, the thing I'm most proud of. It, let me give you an analogy. It, it's like being a rookie baseball player, being put into the World Series at the bottom of the ninth inning with bases loaded and we're losing by three runs, and you hit a grand slam home run. Now you can play for 20 years, and it will never happen again. That's it. It's downhill from then on, and that's the way Penhurst was for me. Is there a single image from Penhurst that you'll never be able to forget? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the two of them. Uh, being in that award with the 80 cribs and being in that uh, giant uh, uh, room with everybody just sitting around, moaning, groaning, banging their heads, crying. Uh, to this day, I can still see it vividly. It's there. it will always be there. And uh, I'm just glad things changed. Have you visited Penhurst since its closure? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Yeah, I've done many interviews there. Uh, yeah, people always want to go back to do an interview, which I did. That, it was more accessible before uh, the last several years. And we can always go back there. And I even went through the buildings, I think it was last year, went through the buildings again, brought back a lot of memories. And uh, what people don't realize, the buildings are in terrible shape, but they were in terrible shape 50 years ago. They couldn't have passed, not one of them could have passed any kind of inspection, but nobody cared. Didn't matter. See, that, that was the, the problem. It just didn't matter. It, this wasn't important to anybody. Do you remember um, how you felt when the last of the residents left Penhurst? Yeah, I, I couldn't have been happier. When Penhurst finally closed, uh, it was like someone gave me this great gift. I was ecstatic. I couldn't believe it, but I was happy, and my next concern was, what are we going to do? And the community living arrangements worked out great. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think a lot of people are a lot better off today because of everything that happened up there and all the court cases. And it was worthwhile. It's a worthwhile effort on everyone's part, no doubt about it.